We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone, and uh, apologies for the short delay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome uh, to all participants uh, on site and uh, um, remote. Uh, it's a pity it didn't work for everyone to be in Katowice, uh, but thanks to uh, the Polish government, uh, this hybrid meeting offers an inclusive opportunity for everyone to participate. Uh, my name is Manal Ismail. I'm Chief Expert Internet Policies at the National Telecom Regulatory Authority of Egypt and moderator of this session um, on the occasion of the launch of a new book titled Power and Authority in Internet Governance, Return of the State. The book examines the controversial topic of uh, the role of the state in Internet governance in light of today's digital society, picking up on debates over digital sovereignty, and compiling views by uh, various stakeholders from different regions, sectors, uh, and regimes. Uh, the book is co-edited by uh, Blaine uh, Haggard, uh, Associate Professor at uh, Brock University, uh, Natasha Tasaikov, uh, Assistant Professor at York University, and Jan uh, Art Schulte, uh, Chair of Global Transformations and uh, Governance Challenges at Leiden University. Um, I'm honored today to be accompanied by two of the co-editors, uh, Blaine, who volunteered to help with the moderation, and Jan, who volunteered to assume the rapporteur role, and three uh, of the authors of the book, uh, Olga Cavalli from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Argentina, uh, Ting Blue, uh, senior lecturer, rec lecturer at uh, Manchester Metropolitan University, and Niels Ten Ufer, a postdoctoral researcher at University of uh, Amsterdam. This is in addition to um, Anita Goromorti, a founding member and executive director of IT for Change, as a discussant to enrich and inspire our brainstorming. Uh, without any further ado, allow me to hand over the floor to Blaine uh, for a brief description of the project behind this book. Blaine, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, Manuel. Um, very good morning from Canada, and uh, very glad to be here, if only uh, if only virtually with all of you. Um, I just want to give a, a few words about the book itself before uh, before turning it over to the uh, the people who actually you know uh, contributed the chapters for the book. Um, so it the book itself came about from a uh, July 2019 workshop that we held at the uh, Center for Global Cooperation Research at the University of Duisburg Essen. Uh, in Germany, um, and uh, yeah, the idea for the book, and they're also they were also responsible for the uh, for the I guess the book series of Rutledge that uh, that the book ended up being published with, um, and the idea for the uh, for the book itself came out of Emmanuel Macron's speech to the IGF in 2018, which I'm sure a lot of you uh, remember, uh, where he called for greater state involvement in internet governance. Um, um, as those of you who were there for the speech uh, will, will recall, it was a very attention-getting speech. Um, and so we decided to use it as our as a kind of our entry point into this really eternal question of, or longstanding question of, well, what is the state's role in internet governance? Um, because it's always had a role, but you know, what is it? What should it be? What are the effects of, of, of how it's being uh, enacted? And so these were the questions that we put to our authors, uh, several of whom are uh, here today. Um, now, one of the things we wanted to do with the book is look at actually existing state involvement in internet governance, kind of moving beyond the authoritarianism versus freedom narrative that too often shapes these debates and to see if there's any commonalities or differences um, in ways that, uh, that internet governance is viewed or, or practiced throughout the world. And this kind of led almost naturally to uh, the division that we ended up with in the book, where the first part really talks about internet governance and the state from kind of a, a, a bird's eye view or a holistic perspective. And this is represented today by uh, Olga and, and Nils's contributions. Um, uh, we've got a couple others in the book as well. 
Um, the second uh, part of the book looks at internet governance as it is practiced in authoritarian countries, focusing, as we did in the book, specifically on Russia and China. And Ting is one of the authors of one of our China-focused chapters. And the third section focuses on internet governance and democratic countries. And it draws on case studies focused on the European Union, Brazil, and Latin American uh, generally. Um, now, time constraints meant we couldn't fit everybody onto the panel, but I, I will say that you know all of them are, are very excellent chapters. And for those of you who are interested, um, I am posting, in, I'm gonna post in the chat if I can, in a moment, maybe a, uh, a flyer for 20% off the book, um, because you know sometimes even academics have to be just a little bit mercenary. Um, so also, as you might be able to tell from this very brief overview, is that the volume itself attempts to look at these issues without falling back on kind of dominant American and Western European perspectives. Um, anyway, I, I'll, I'll end this, all this by saying for my part that, you know, it, for, uh, for the editors, it was a pleasure to work with all of, all of our authors and all of you. And um, I, for our authors, I hope that you're as happy uh, with the outcome as, uh, as the editors were. Um, so thanks, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Blaine. And uh, we will now go to our panelists for a five minute introductory statement by each. Uh, and I would like to start by Olga Cavalli. Uh, so over to you, Olga, please. Thank you. Thank you, Manal. Dear Manal, nice to see you virtually. I miss our ICA meetings, really. Thank you to the Polish government for organizing the IGF. Unfortunately, I couldn't, I decided not to travel. I could have, but I decided not to travel because of all the uncertainties. But the good thing is that it's it's quite hot here in Argentina. We have summertime, so that that is a that is a good uh, thing for me. And good morning from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Thanks to the editors for inviting me to this um, to this panel, and thanks for uh, editing this book, which I think is very interesting. Uh, the chapter where I work with my dear colleague Jan Art Scholte. And he, he was so good to put in the good format, uh, the ideas that we had together through that process that we lived in, in one part of the ICANN history. It's about the evolution, uh, the role of government in, the, in, in ICANN. In, in particular, we focus on the, what was called the IANA transition, that it was a process that happened in between 2014 and 2016. Uh, when I can oversaw the transfer of responsibility for certain core technical functions to the internet uh, from the United States governments to the global multi-stakeholder community. If you recall the history of the IGF, like 15 years ago, when we were in Tunis, the idea of creating this forum was mainly to discuss this a role of some countries into the administration of some critical internet resources. The internet has evolved. And the concept of the internet governance was defined as holistic. So, so that has evolved as well. But if you recall, the, the original idea of the IGF was mainly focused on the administration of these critical internet resources. Uh, at that time, uh, at the time of that process, I was vice chair of the GAC, uh, representing my country, Argentina, and uh, Jan Art was an uh, 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 external advisor to that process. So we both had a quite privileged and different focuses in that process. And for me, it was very intense and, and quite very, very interesting. I felt very privileged to be part of that. So uh, we, we all know that ICANN is a key multi-stakeholder organization in, in the internet governance, making policy for the domain name system, overseeing implementation of some uh, IETF functions and the regional internet registries functions, and of course, the uh, overseas the management of the root zone files. So, the organization has a unique uh, structure. It's, it's quite unique and it is multi-stakeholder, but uh, as a difference from the Internet Governance Forum where we, we all stakeholders have an equal footing, in ICANN, uh, stakeholders have a different role and in particular governments gather in, in an advisor committee, which is called the GAC, the Government Advisor Committee, that issues advice to the board. So uh, it's not involved in defining the policy, but it, it issues advice to the policy once it's defined, or now um, it is involved perhaps in, in earlier process that has changed a little bit with the time. But uh, um, at the end, um, it's the board and other uh, supporting organizations, the ones to define the, um, uh, the, the rules. The board is required to adopt the, what the GAC advises or just say no, and but they have to justify the refusal. 
um, it is not bound to the GAC advice. And the GAC has no legal sanctions available if the board rejects uh, what the GAC uh, recommends. So that's, uh, as you can see, the role of the government within ICANN. It's, uh, it's perhaps different than like other um, internet governance organizations. So the chapter focuses on one part of the IANA transition. Um, it's, um, I don't want to take a lot of time. Um, so the main focus of the chapter was about one part of the IANA transition for the establishment of a mechanism to enhance the accountability of ICANN, given that ICANN would be independent from the United States government. That, that, is, that was a big change. Some, some people thought that that was kind of a privatization of ICANN. So there was also a political discussion within the United States at that time between the different representatives of, of both main parties. And um, finally, you have to read the book. <laughs> you have to read the chapter for all the details. And uh, we concluded that while states have become more active in multi-stakeholder processes at ICANN, they overall still hold a secondary role. And we include some ideas on how this role of governments could be enhanced. And at the same time, we state the fact that states should have should participate more actively within ICANN because sometimes some stakeholders request for some more participation, but then they don't, they don't use that opportunity to uh, be more involved in. And I will stop here and I will, uh, and I will uh, welcome comments or questions from colleagues and from participants. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, Olga. Um, and, and thank you, Blaine, as well, for uh, sharing the flyer in the chat. <clears throat> we will be allowing 15 minutes uh, at the end of the session for Q&A. So please uh, note down your questions or comments until then. And uh, for now, I would like to turn next to Ting Lu. Please, Ting, go ahead. Good afternoon from Manchester. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, well, although it's a pity I cannot travel to Pol Poland, but thanks to the internet, we can still attend the meeting remotely. Now talking about internet, of course, we get, need to get back to internet governance. So uh, this chapter uh, I co-authored with my colleague, uh, Dr. Alfa Yuli. So uh, I want to start like, uh, with the motivation we have in this chapter, uh, taking what uh, Blaine had mentioned earlier. So in our chapter, we were in check by the binary division between authoritarian and democratic states when people talk about internet or internet government. Now, internet government in democratic states quite often has a positive connotation. So, and they are also quite often associated with positive work, like freedom of speech or like liberation. But when we talk about internet government in authoritarian regime or talk about internet in general in authoritarian state, on the opposite, people quite often, you know, associate this term with negative connotation. Uh, now, taking China's internet governance model as an example, Western scholars and observers quite often perceive China's internet model as one in which the all powerful authoritarian regime is able to utilize the internet or the technology as some sort of uh, surveillance or control technology and to stay in this authoritarian rule. And I think uh, we think this telling emphasizes you know, the following the hegemonic nature of the Chinese regime you know, the great firewall that separate the Chinese domestic network from the global one, or the censorship of sensitive information or blocking of one website or even suppression of dissident news. However, we think that this is just one side of the story. This will focus on the use of the internet in sensitive area. So those that are vital to the legitimacy or the survival of the regime. In contrast, little attention has been paid to Chinese internet government in non-sensitive area such as you know, promoting technological driven economic development or even the regulation of online content, which is the focus of this chapter. Now, so um, I want to highlight that also we borrow these, uh, the lens of fragmented authoritarianism, uh, initially uh, termed by Lieberthal uh, back in 1970s. Um, they use this term to this demonstrate Chinese government's approach to uh, general governance. So I went very briefly on this framework. Um, so even though China is an authoritarian regime whereby the policy making power is monopoly by a small number of top officials at the central level. But Chinese leader, they do face challenging governing a country that is both vast and diverse in population and, 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 and in terms of population and territory. So to deal with the challenges, responsibility and authority are delegate both vertically from the top to the bottom and horizontally across different authority, different uh, uh, ministry, different bureaus. 
In other words, the authoritarian state in China is not unified. Instead, it's fragmented and destroyed. And that's what we turn fragmented authoritarian state. Now, then uh, turn to internet government. Uh, in this chapter, our focus is on content regulation, one area of internet government. And we use this framework to demonstrate how internet government work in China. We find that the nature of internet governance really depends on the sensitivity nature of the areas. So in sensitive areas that are vital to party survival, we observe a continuous effort by the Chinese government to centralize authoritarian control. But in non-sensitive areas, such as the online health content or online advertisement, the focus of the case study in our chapter, we observe fragmentation. And we use this Chinese uh, metaphor, night dragons run the water to demonstrate this situation. You know, um, so Chinese dragon are different from the Western one. So Western dragon typically breathe fire, but ours don't. So the Chinese dragon uh, tend to be considered as like ben benevolent rulers or emperors. So in Chinese uh, mythology, dragon are quite often, uh, they are authority responsible for controlling or managing water or weather. And when the night dragons each have their own opinion on how to run the water or the weather, then either no dragons take the initiative to manage the water or either everyone try to compete for the management. And the result will be disaster. Either there are too much water, there's a flood, or too little, like a drought. So, so basically, I think this vividly demonstrates what, how, how does it work in China as well when it comes to internet government in non-sensitive area. So basically this governance of non-sensitive or non-priority area, they are fragmented among multiple government agency with conflicting agenda and interests. And we basically, the result in our case is a regulatory vacuum whereby it's in no authority's mandate and responsibility to add or regulate. And, um, and we also find that when it comes to this case, uh, in our case study, for example, the exaggerated claims of medical treatment or even fake medical information online that seriously affect pa pa patients' life choices, the response from government were linear, one off, and targeted at specific issues. Limited legal steps at the time were taken by the government to avoid occurrence of similar problems in the future online. So this is just a basic introduction of the chapter. I, I know we have time later to talk about the implication of state role. So now it's back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ting, for uh, sharing uh, your um, initial remarks on this hot topic and uh, your part of the book and uh, introducing what I believe may be uh, selective governance, depending on the sensitivity <laughs> of the issue. Um, our third speaker is uh, Niels uh, Ten Ufer. Um, so over to you, Niels, before um, we dive deeper uh, into the discussion. Please go ahead. Thanks so much for this opportunity. And it is a really a distinct pleasure to be with you all, be it virtually. Whereas with this practice, we might be contributing to climate justice, an issue that emerges, but also probably intersects and will intersect more with internet infrastructure governance in the near future. But now first towards this excellent book, where it's been a real pleasure to work on and to learn from all the other authors and editors who really took a lot of care in their work and it really tells a unified story of the continuously developing practice that is the internet. Because just like uh, Heraclitus already said, you cannot stand in a river twice, and Jacques Derrida added on that, that you cannot stand in a river once, the internet is continuously evolving and changing. So talking about internet governance is also talking about a continuously evolving practice. So since the mid 1990s, multi-stakeholder governance and specifically private internet governance has been viewed as a governance innovation and a departure from intergovernmental telecommunications governance. However, in the 2010s, the private internet governance regime characterized by multi-stakeholder bottom-up self-regulation started to show some signs of wear and tear with the increased rule setting done by states and multilateral bodies. For instance, several states have felt that they currently have insufficient stake in the decision-making in the internet corporation for assigned names and numbers. The body that coordinates the usage of unique identifiers such as top level domains and IP addresses that are foundational for the internet. Other states such as China and Russia have gone further by unilaterally proposing and enacting national regulations and creating domestic internet infrastructures in order to better exert influence on the internet. 
This contest, at its heart, involves a contest between conflicting norms. The private multi-stakeholder internet interconnection through industry coordination and norm development. In contrast, the multilateral regime seeks to achieve a number of other goals, including, but not limited to, maximizing state sovereignty, promoting economic prosperity, and limiting the spread of harmful and illegal content through laws, policies, and norm setting. I argue that the private multi-stakeholder and the multilateral regime are two different regimes that are guided by different norms. The private multi-stakeholder regime aims to create interconnection, largely between multinational corporations, to create a transnational seamless network, whereas the multilateral regime seems to inscribe local and regional norms exactly in this network. <clears throat> but I then argue that instead of looking at these regimes as being in contestation with each other, I think that we should see this as an overarching meta-governance regime, where both regimes function are optimized to serve different goals and jointly can produce a transnational network as it is the internet today. What is going to be very exciting in the coming time is to see how these two regimes interact and will they merge together or, and, or how will they adapt to the power of the other? Will there be a division of tasks and labor and how will that be uh, contested and coordinated? I think that will be an interesting research area for the coming time that we already see playing out in the next generation of infrastructure, such as 5G and quantum technologies. I hope this was a, a, a useful input. I greatly look forward to discuss it with you. Very useful indeed, uh, Niels. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for uh, describing the different uh, uh, models and the different regimes. And, uh, it's interesting to see how uh, things will fold and whether they will uh, compete, coexist, complement. Uh, but uh, before getting uh, deeper into the discussion, I would like to hand the floor uh, to our discussant, um, Anita Goromorti. Um, Anita, I appreciate your views on how you see the debate over the role of states in internet governance. Um, it would be great if you can share your perspective, teasing further input uh, from our panelists and from our audience as well. Please, Anita, over to you. Thank you so much, Mana, and congratulations to all authors and editors. This is a thought-provoking, elegantly argued, and exceptionally significant contribution to the discourse. Really refreshing. Maybe we are birds of a feather, but so what? And I'm ever so grateful to join this session, Niels, when, we, when you were describing the process uh, and the journey. Um, I felt, you know, envious that I was not part of the journey, but I'm really glad I'm able to join you. The book signals for me a counterfactual moment, you know, what would have happened to the internet had it not been for the totalizing control of digital capitalism. Of course, this is not to go back, and it certainly is not about the book. Um, as Blaine pointed out, what this book urges is that the debate must move beyond a simplistic dichotomy between liberalism and authoritarianism in order to consider also greater state involvement based on the values of democracy and human rights. Olga and Jan, uh, your story of uh, the INS stewardship transition lays out brilliantly the need to shift focus to corporate dominance. I loved your autoethnographic account. And as I was reading it, you know, the experiences of IT for Change, you know, came back to me. Uh, I miss, you know, bumping into all of you in, in those corridors of power. Ting and Alfai, I think your co-authors also present today. Your thesis about China's political versus economic statecraft is extremely valuable, especially in the context of the often blunt analysis we see in Western and Northern academia of uh, the Chinese context. Anil's your submission that the unease in the internet governance terrain is a conflict of prioritized values within uh, what is actually a single regime complex and not an existential conflict between private and public governance, I take on board. But I would also like to understand how, given the deep tentacles of digital corporations, we can set boundaries for private governance and repoliticize uh, public governance so that our institutions can be adequate to the digital moment. 
Since the book was put together, the context has changed considerably. And I'll start with China. China's recent regulatory interventions in sectors such as uh, education tech, which is ed tech business models, and its AI, artificial intelligence regulation, and most recently, the revoking of cryptocurrency mining licenses due to concerns about energy guzzling and financial risks, all of this point to willingness, and perhaps some would say, uh, you know, political motivations to take on capital. China is willing to incur the risks of negative market sentiment. The stock exchange, the New York Stock Exchange can go anywhere. And this is more than what conventional liberal democratic states have been willing to do. There's room to not dismiss this as irrelevant to the project of public interest. Research on AI ethics shows how China bashing can be unproductive. For example, credit scoring algorithms in China are predominantly used not against individuals, as is often made out to be the case, but for tracking businesses and their compliance. Unidimensional explorations of authoritarianism in the Chinese case also obscure the inefficacy of data and algorithmic governance in other jurisdictions, such as the EU, for preventing human rights data abuses by corporations. While these developments in China only bolster the conclusions of this book, they also behoove us to think more about another dichotomy, that between digital public policy and the rest of public policy. Digital governance is intermeshed with governance in a more fundamental way. Its protocol power reshapes the values, norms, worldviews, principles, rules, incentives, disincentives, etc., that make up the social body politic in democracy. We need to think more about repoliticizing the discourse of governance and ask what constitutes public interest with respect to social, cultural, economic, ecological, and many other publics. The second point I want to make is that the regime complex as colliding value systems where privatized control meets state governmentality may need some deeper interrogation. In my view, we must capture the discursive hegemony of multi-stakeholderism for its extraordinary hold of public imagination, not only in digital governance. From where I come, multi-stakeholderism is playing a constitutive role in the very de-democratization of public policy processes, both national and global. As the digital enters all aspects of social life, public policy questions in socioeconomic domains become entangled with transnational digital capital and its breezy technicalization of political aspects of governance. A global consensus around multi-stakeholderism in the digital arena thus supplants democratic deliberation, legitimizing privatized technocracy as the obvious approach in all of public policy making. With the political economy of international development linked to data value chains, many countries, even if they so desire, may not be able to contain private capital. Clauses and trade deals require countries to part with their data in all sectors. On the other hand, public interest exceptions in the WTO, for instance, to demand that digital behemoths open up their algorithmic practices cannot simply be enforced. Then there is development financing, which is closely tied to tax justice and the obduracy of digital corporations and rich countries to refuse to bend. There's thus a loss of autonomy at many levels. And so the question is, how do we deal with the de-democratization of public policy processes in this skewed terrain of international development under digital capitalism? My third point is related. The liberal human rights regime founded in the enlightenment ideas of the unencumbered man, the rational man, is unable to prevent the extraction of sociality and intimate life worlds by digital capital. Currently, there's a lot of focus on how, if only we ensure that liberal fixes are not compromised by market state pacts, we can have an equitable digital order. But the political and economic tools of statecraft drawn from post-war liberal constitutionalism is unable to provide an emancipatory sociality. This would need an intervention that is a step change, not an incremental change. The questions for democracy and human rights need answers in a supra-liberal framework of justice. I come back to my counterfactual to conclude. 
What would have happened if the political constitutionalism of the internet and its multilateral governance had been designed differently? For this, power and authority in digital governance must be placed within conceptions of global justice. This is, of course, a question for procedural democracy, but also for problematizing the limits of liberal ideals of democracy and human rights. It's about replacing the market with new civic public institutional frameworks and key aspects of the digital domain, taking the tech back and dealing with the question of pure public goods, globally, nationally, subnationally. This is where we need a carefully crafted return of the state and internet governance, as the editors put it, that can support a new architecture of autonomous civic publics. And to borrow from Harris Gleckman and Giorgio's Costa Coast, we do need a revitalized multilateralism of an open UN with formal constituency assemblies offering their collective knowledge and advocacy positions for consideration by intergovernmental bodies. Pie in the sky? Maybe, but I leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nita, for the uh, provoking questions and uh, inspiring thoughts. And uh, with that, I would like to go through a, a second iteration uh, with our speakers um, for further elaborations, views, or reactions to uh, your inspiring thoughts. Um, so following the same order, um, Olga, please, would you like to start? Yes. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you, Manal, and thank you, Anita. Um, a lot of thoughts, and uh, I, 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 as I said, when I started to talk about the role of ICANN and uh, the concept of internet governance has evolved all through all these years. And as you rightly mentioned, um, we we are facing uh, new challenges, like um, what happens with free flow of, of, of data among countries, sovereignty. The role of the of the different um, in, in artificial intelligence technology that is being used, and for me, uh, living in a developing economy and a developing region, what happens to us being consumers of technology and sending data to some other platform? I'm not saying that it is wrong or, or right. I'm saying just that it's a new reality. And as you rightly mentioned, that we should think about how to revitalize. The, um, the different uh, spaces that we have for, for discussions, especially we are focused and I, I've been um, investigating this for many years, the role, uh, how can developing countries really contribute and be a part of an active, uh, be, have a, an active role and a relevant role in all these discussions. And this is a major, this is a major issue because the, we have seen a, a special concentration of power in the internet in the latest years. Again, I'm not saying this is wrong or right. I'm saying this is a new reality. And uh, with this gap in between the digital um, improving of the economy and of the society, the, the profit from the society of using technology in developing economies is becoming more and more complex. So um, this gap is, is widening. So how can we make this developing economies be more active and more relevant in, in, the, in their participation in these uh, spaces? And so I see this concept that you said revitalize this, this spaces is relevant. I don't know how. For the moment, what we have been trying is to, um, to train our, our participants. Maybe, mainly I see problem in governments in, in moving from the, the old structures like multilateral structures in, in the officials in, in having a new view and trying to capture the value of a multi-stakeholder dialogue, for example, in the IGF or in other spaces, in particular in ICANN. And I'm not a, in the GAC anymore because there are other colleagues from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, luckily <laughs> younger people doing that role. I see, a, a, a lower involvement of government, effective involvement. So I see this is a missing opportunity. So uh, once we have a space, we have to be sure that all the countries and all the governments are do use that space and use it in a relevant role, in a relevant way, and at the same time, uh, revitalize those that are stuck to uh, old uh, ways of, of participation, like multilateral. This is a huge challenge. I see it um, as, as, a, as the journey and not the destination. It's an evolving issue. 
but we we that we are involved in this multi stakeholder um, uh, spaces and then we may have some experiences to share we should be the ones in bringing these ideas especially to developing economies developed countries maybe have more resources to have specialized officials of the government to go and participate actively and more relevantly in these spaces but for me the, the big challenge is is uh, our developing economies in particular latin america has been the region with suffer most of the of this crisis after COVID, we are the region with the lowest, um, um, with the, the highest decrease in our economy. So I see as an opportunity. I'm always optimistic. I see this as an opportunity. Thank you very much, Olga, uh, and um, thank you for uh, building on uh, what Anita mentioned regarding how to revitalize the different spaces and also for your uh, focusing on how developing economies can have an active and relevant role. Uh, indeed, it's a, it's a huge challenge, and um, when we speak about governments, the the the, the weight would be in having all governments uh, talking and voicing uh, their concerns and not only a handful or, or a single government. So uh, we need uh, uh, everyone uh, to be involved and have an, an active and relevant role. Um, so I would like to give uh, the floor next to Ting, please. Over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for Anita's comment. That's so provoking. So. Um... So I think I would like to go back to these uh, sort of binary division between authoritarian and uh, democratic state first, and also want to address uh, some of these points you mentioned about the recent development in China. So I think the first point I want to mention, I want to say that uh, at least from our study, uh, it, it demonstrates that regardless of the nature of the political regime, either it's you know democratic or authoritarian, China does not differ much from Western liberal democratic country in their struggle to regulate or manage user generated content online, and. And I, I, we believe that given the rapid development of digital technology and the sheer amount of online content, uh, government around the world have to you know, basically share the same difficulty in trying to govern the internet. And we, so that's why we think that nine dragons run the water. Basically, it does not just apply to China. And, and moreover, in, especially in, in this case, in our case study, uh, it, it does demonstrate that when in, in response to this decentralized nature of online content, um, content regulation in China is also decentralized to involve not just the government, but also companies uh, and users as well. So I think this also is the same in terms of the, you know, the response to this kind of challenge, generally to the challenge of internet government. Um, the second point I want to mention, maybe that also happened uh, related to what you, uh, what you, 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 you thought about the recent development. Um, I think uh, given the, the kind of the challenge we face in internet governance, government have to spend the resources in areas they deem important or they deem sensitive, right? So uh, these in China or in the West also involve setting priority. So in China, basically that means priority areas are areas that's sensitive, right? In the West, maybe it's different. Now, this comes to uh, what you mentioned about the recent development or you know, the step taken by China, Chinese government, how they are maybe more capable than, the, for example, the US government, they're less constrained to do things that you think might be good for the public interest, perhaps, right? Now, I want to highlight that even though in my chapter, I mentioned about sensitivity, meaning that uh, those, those area that is uh, vital to the regime's stability or the party's rule, and and although you know some existing Western studies uh, study tend to mention this has to do with you know uh, the kind of content or the kind of area that's likely to trigger collective actions, but I must mention that um, my understanding is China you can in a way understand China's government as the you know this guardianship model of government. Now, legitimacy in this kind of government does not lie at how they get their power, so not by election, but by outcome. So outcome meaning that whether they are able to de deliver tangible benefit to its people or nations. So when it comes to economic development, if economic development is so crucial to the development of the, to the party's rule, and of course, this will be the priority and this will be the sensitive area, and there will be centralized effort. And that's how I see the recent development as well. Maybe this issue is becoming sensitive or becoming crucial to the region's survival. So they have to put more efforts. They have to be a little bit more, perhaps more, uh, well, maybe not liberal, but a, a bit more brave in you know, tackling those issues. And, and I think, and what else, uh, something else I also want to highlight, uh, thank you for bringing up this social credit system issue. I agree with you that the, the outside of, you know, outside of China, people tend to consider social credit system as something that target individuals. And, and I, I, I agree with what you, what you said. And totally, I, I have a new, uh, 
working paper entitled Surveillance by Popular Consent with my with other co-authors I have and a few other co-authors. And basically uh, from this project on social credit system, I want to highlight that this also applies to internet government in China. I also want to highlight it's not just the division about uh, the binary division about authoritarian regime and, and, and democratic state. We also need to pay attention to the context, the context, especially, you know, what was the state of course. Internet government or social credit system, they are the same in the sense that the state of course, let's say, let's take social credit system, for example, right? The state of course, we don't have anything like that in the past. So what happened at that time is just a very brief example. What happened in the past is, you know, uh, there are a lot of fraud or, or scams that happen. Victims do not get their compensation or offender can just, you know, get no punishment and move to somewhere else, start new business. It's not like in the West, you have something, you have a credit history. Everyone has something to constrain or to discipline their behavior. But in China, we don't have that. So that was the straight course. And the social credit system to understand that, or the same for internet government, to understand what's going on now, we have to see what was that before these new reform and before all this new development. So that's my response. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ting, uh, for your thoughts and um, highlighting the effect of different priorities and how models could be made legitimate. Um, and a, a very interesting uh, title of your new paper. Looking forward to read this one too. Um, uh, we, we started five minutes late and I think we're exactly five minutes uh, delayed. So um, I hope we will be able to still uh, give the audience uh, the, the promised 15 minutes uh, for their questions. But before that, uh, Nils, uh, over to you, please. I promise, uh, dear chair, I will keep it very short. But I was slightly surprised that the, by the provocation of the discussant who localized the source of global uh, social justice with public institutions, I personally would rather focus on collectives and movements of people. Because what we are currently seeing is that people are being excommunicated from information infrastructures in the sense that the users are not configuring them but are being configured. So, but who is now vying over the control of these transnational information infrastructures, whether it's states or corporations, this is an ongoing battle that has been going on for ages. Transnational communication networks, since the first inter intercontinental cable was laid in 1865, have been a proxy for power and are produced in contestation among and between states and corporations. States have been complete, complicit in creating surveillance capitalism, as uh, Julie Cohen argues. In the 3GPP, it are governments demanding surveillance APIs on every layer of the stack. And uh, it have not been time and again governments, for instance, arguing in the, uh, in the Internet Engineering Task Force for Human Rights Protections. So that does not mean that governments do not have a role, nor that corporations have a role. But I think it's very uh, 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 it's slightly dangerous to say that one actor can say we can we can say as a defender of the public goods, and neither can civil society. But what is very important is that we continue creating a social technical imaginary of what we want communication infrastructures of the future to be. How can we? Be, we're now building on our uh, uh, information societies on completely privately owned and uh, governed platforms. Yes, we're coming up with laws, but what is really the network we want? What would a real democratic uh, infrastructure look like that people can configure, uh, materialize, and that they can uh, also use to experiment and explore themselves instead of being reduced to customer and consumer? So I think that is the big question. So how can we really reappropriate the infrastructures for the people instead of uh, 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 producing consumers and citizens. Thank you very much, Niels. <clears throat> Um, th thanks for your uh, comments and uh, highlighting the, the dangerous uh, to say that one actor is the defender of the public good. Uh, indeed, uh, it has to be a collective effort and uh, 
uh, looking at uh, the time, I think we we are good now to open the floor for any questions. Um, thanks to um, our uh, panelists, Olga Ting and, and uh, Niels, and thanks to Anita as well. Uh, any comments or questions? And and. Uh, Please, uh, Bail, if there is something I have overlooked, uh, please let me know. I don't think so. And if anyone wants to just put their hand up or uh, write your question in the chat, and uh, I'm sure our panelists would be happy to answer. Sure. And uh, so uh, meanwhile, as we are waiting for hands, um, uh, I, I see Olga's hand up. Please, Olga, go ahead. Thank you. In the meantime, that we uh, wait for some colleagues in the audience to to comment. I would like to build upon what Neil said. Um, yes, you're right. This is an old an old thing that we have been following and experiencing from ages. But the, the the big change now is that the the, the amount of information that is created uh, all over the world by half the of the population being connected to the internet and uh, the very high speed that it that any con content is spread all over the world. I think this makes really the difference. And the flow of information from many countries to some platforms that are um, in, in few countries. And again, I'm, I'm not saying this is good or bad. It's, it's the reality of it's, it's a sign of the time. And this is what we have to focus on. And in, in relation with the role of states, um, Yes, uh, all stakeholders have a stake at, at the, what happens with the internet, but, but states have this responsibility at the national level within the boundaries, and they have responsibilities for their citizens, for, for, for different regimes at the national, provincial, or, or county level. So um, it, is, it is a special stakeholder. It's, um, it's a it's somehow different. It's a different species of, of stakeholder. So just wanted to build upon that and maybe provoke your response. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Olga. And uh, uh, I see uh, Anita's hand up. Please, Anita, go ahead. Yes, I think it, it would be lovely to do this over a coffee face to face and all the debate that requires. I think for us to sit in the same room. But I think in the new uh, context, uh, what we do really see is the hollowing out of the public in the developing world. And I think um, Olga's vocabulary coming from where she is, is you know, uh, framing the problem similarly, but with different kinds of uh, epistemic locations. But you know, coming from where uh, we see, uh, for instance, in various, uh, health data you know you you know what happened with the palantir deal in in the uk you know and we are actually seeing that data is really going out from the health system the public health system to reclaim it in the form of data trusts with individuals and communities is is really not an option because you really don't have a canopy of a public law which recognizes that data is a commons where access to rights and uh, you know the inappropriability of data by any one person who can enclose it in this instance of course the digital corporation that has to be legitimated through a public process and i think that the existence of collectivities you know collaboratives cooperatives uh, etc which manage uh, digital goods you know um, for for those communities a different ideal of I think public law, different ideal of public institutions, their roles, their mediating uh, um, responsibilities, uh, those are needed. So I, I do think that that revitalization is about really looking at a new pillar for democracy where you know, the state is not above uh, scrutiny um, of the public or the communities. That's what I mean. Um, and I, I, I think that the idea of claims and entitlements from the developing world is one that's always, um, uh, citizenship being enacted constantly and for that you know the 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 corporate power and private power really has to be something that the state takes responsibility to check and that's been our experience you know whether it is physical resources or it is the intangibles of data that's where i'm coming from and i do certainly believe that communities should really be the at the edge of this movement towards uh, uh, emancipatory existence 
Thank you very much, uh, Anita. And um, in lack of um, other questions, uh, maybe uh, I can uh, break the ice with one. Uh, so, um, in in light of our discussions today and and the excellent book we have at hand, um, what do you expect uh, for the future in terms of the role of uh, state? Uh, how, how would it evolve? Should uh, we expect more involvement from uh, states or less involvement uh, looking forward? And uh, would this be considered um, uh, um, something good or bad? And uh, are we in the right direction to where we would like to be or we should uh, do things differently? So if, um, if there are any um, expectations to how this uh, role would uh, evolve, the role of governments, and, and I, I like uh, very much how, how the, the book uh, concluded that uh, the question is not uh, whether uh, the state should be involved in internet governance. Um, it always has been and uh, the question should be how the state uh, can be most constructively engaged in uh, internet governance. So um, this um, struck me as a, a, a good conclusion. And uh, sorry, I'm just reading the chat. Um, Ian, please go ahead. Uh, Ian, if you're speaking, you, you're on. No, 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 yes. no, I, ha okay. I have a, I have a resistant computer um no i just i just want to 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 uh, see if i pull niels and anita out yes. a little bit more uh, do i do i hear you both in a sense saying in your different ways that the debate posing the debate as multilateralism no, versus no, 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 i'm sorry Adrian, I think someone you've got a, yeah, yeah someone yeah, needs to now. mute please i think it i think it's gone now yeah it's okay uh, that, that posing the debate as conventionally done between multilateralism and multi-stakeholderism is not the most constructive politically uh that you would rather pose it as governmentality versus emancipation or i i, I Niels, you have a different, a different kind of rationale, but you have different languages, but am I hearing both of you say that the posing of the question about authority and, 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 and state and so on in internet governance as a multilateralism versus multi-stakeholderism is not the most productive way to conduct the debate? Um, Anika, will you go first? <laughs> I think the, for me, they are apples and oranges. I think multilateralism is a pre-existing form of, uh, you know, some kind of inter intergovernmental. Of course, multilateralism can have many meanings, but in the context of, um, you know, the international, uh, you know, politics in, in the context of uh, absent democracy globally, what it simply means is the way intergovernmental cooperation takes place uh, in, in the United Nations, which is supposed to really house this membership. Um, for me, multi stakeholderism is an invention of uh, participatory democracy. So it's a process. And uh, it's a process in which the stakeholderism um, and the contents and the discontents of stakeholderism can be unpacked in many, many ways. And what literature the literature shows is that in mostly in the bland ways by which people understand stakeholderism, uh, the claims uh, of people, the, the weightage that should be given to power, and all of those things are absent, you know, when you really refer to multi-stakeholderism, although in its most benign and charitable, uh, you know, form, it could be interpreted as listening to everybody being inclusive, etc. But in the ways in which it's translated um, into making way for inclusive discourses, in the internet governance space, multi-stakeholderism, I think, deserves a very, very uh, strident uh, criticism. So for me, there are uh, imperfections with multilateralism. We have seen it. Um, and we do 
not to know at this point in time, despite hundreds of years of experience in uh, with democracy, how else to reinvent our global existence. But the internet makes such shared global existence necessary and we need to reinvent multilateralism and probably use the internet itself as a tool to do so. Multi-stakeholderism, my contention is we really need a vocabulary that's post-multi-stakeholderist. I think stakes don't describe the way claims get politically mediated because political claims in any context are embedded in, in, in power relations in a, in a particular social context. And therefore, I might have a claim actually to drive my car, but you know, it might actually be deemed by the court that pedestrians have a better right to walk on those streets. So the mediation, I think, is very important. I don't quite like the stakeholderist language at all. Thank you very much, Anita, for sharing your uh... Uh, interesting thoughts on uh, multi-stakeholderism versus uh, multilateralism. Uh, Niels, would you like to go next? Yeah, I, I, I would just offer a footnote to, uh, to the things uh, 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 Anita said, by while completely reinforcing what she said, is that, and by while also dodging the question of Jan, is, is, is that I think so, so the greatest things have happened if the interests of states, corporations, and publics converge, then you really see interdisciplinary work that can make things happen. And um, but we're we're now often confronted with we're, we're now at, at times of divergence and in, in many different ways between many different publics, among states, uh, within states. And we need something to build con uh, convergence again, but we're also being thrown quite some curveballs with the current COVID regime. And there we see also like that states are not doing the obvious right thing of releasing intellectual property of uh, COVID vaccines, right? I, it, we, we see how capital also penetrates the state. And this is me coming from the Netherlands where the state has been produced by capital, right? So, 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 so just saying it, capital is more than just corporations. And, 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 but the way to think our way out of a future is a way in which we leverage our different senses of temporality, materiality, and institutionality to come up with a progressive and more equal future. And for that, we really need to focus on imagining that. And, and right now we're still often, and me myself as well, it's, it's easier to be reactive to what is there than to anticipate on what could come. But we need another infrastructure because the current infrastructure will not survive climate change and is definite and, 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 is, and is not necessarily sustainable and creating continuously creating more devices and new networking equipment that's not going to solve many problems but also like where power is shifted in, in oligopolies on every layer of the stack or how we create data publics in which we really enable the sharing of knowledge and emancipate and empower people to do uh, uh, to shape joint futures. So I think that is where we, we need to go. And for that, we really need to open knowledge and uh, uh, liberate that from, from trademarks, from intellectual property, and uh, uh, bring also academics more. And saying that as an academic, well, now we're talking with a lot of academics, with some policymakers, and having those discussions about futures and possibilities, I think is, is, is radical futures and possibilities. There is no time when it was more needed than now. But that has also been said always in history. Thank you very much, Niels. And uh, indeed, uh, there are a, a lot of um, competing and complementing interests. And the more complementing, uh, uh, the, the, the better. I see Blaine's hand up. Yeah, and this goes. Uh, thank you, thanks, Anita, for all the uh, for such insightful comments too. I should say, um, but yeah, to get, to get back to the question about, or or to continue the conversation on the question about, like, you know, what role for the state, more state, good is it? What's happening, good or bad? Uh, I mean, part of you know, for me, the the big interest in, in this volume was it's the idea that you can't escape the state. Like, there, there there's always going to be states there in some way. So, what does that mean? But there's also on the other side too that you can't escape from regulation and or or from like you know consequential rules, whether it's by uh, by states or corporations. And you know like and part of the challenge, uh, at least in Canada, it's part of the challenge here has been, you know, is dealing with uh, with this you know this understanding that I think that 
you know, that a lot of, I think a lot of people on the panel share, you know, this understanding that rules can be consequential, whether or not they come from companies or whether they come from um, non-state organizations or states. But that does not often translate into policymaking within kind of the, you know, in, in kind of general politics, where, again, it's often treated as if it's not, you know, if the state's not regulating it, it's still the Wild West. And, you know, it's so, you know, part of a lot of my interventions in public policy in Canada have been, no, it's not the Wild West. So just trying to, you know, you know, it, it would, one thing, you know, that would be a nice hope is that, you know, our state's headed in the right direction or the wrong direction, but to have the discussion about understanding that the state is going to be there, it should be there, um, what should that look like? And I think, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of, a, it's a very small advance, but I think it would be a very consequential one and it would move it beyond, at least in Canada, where we've got it, where it's basically the state shouldn't be involved. It's like, well, that's, you know, thank, a bit off the table. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blaine. And uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thanks to our speakers, to our audience. Uh, we need to uh, close. So uh, please stay safe and have a very good rest of your days. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Bye. Bye, all.